Hello everyone and welcome to today's educational video, 3D Heart Models Revolutionizing Personalized Cardiac Care. My name is Stephanie Starks and I'll be your co-host along with another heart mom, Trisha Zimmerman. Trisha and I serve on the Heart Center Family Advisory Council as parent advocates and volunteers. Today's educational video is the third in a series of Phoenix Children's Heart Center videos called Heart Talks, designed to help parents and families of children with congenital heart defects better understand the care, treatment, and advancements relating to this condition. My daughter Gemma was born with a critical complex heart defect. Phoenix Children's Hospital saved her life by performing a series of surgeries over the first year of her life. Today, Gemma is a strong, happy, and remarkably healthy toddler. This is a heart model that is an exact replica of my child's heart. And now I'd like to introduce to you another heart mom, Trisha Zimmerman. Thank you, Stephanie. My name is Trisha. My son had a BT shunt done nine years ago. We were told by the surgeon before the surgery that they were not sure what kind of surgery they would do because they had to wait till they actually got in there to know what they could do, what they had room to do. It was the difference between a shorter surgery and a much longer surgery. And since then, he has now had a 3D printout of his heart, which would have been so helpful at that time. So they would have been able to actually look at the heart, touch the heart, know what they were doing before they got in there. So today I am thrilled that Phoenix Children's Hospital is the leader in 3D printing technology and that this 3D model gives us comfort that the surgeons can see exactly what they need to do before the surgery begins. Thank you, Trisha. Before we begin, we'd like to encourage you to please share this video with others. And now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce you to today's speakers, Dr. Stephen Pofall, Division Chief of Cardiology, and Dr. Justin Ryan, Research Scientist. Together, they were both instrumental in pioneering this technology. Dr. Ryan, in establishing the first 3D print lab, you know, we have done many different things with 300 plus prints. What do you think we're gonna be like five years from now? We've got 3D prints made out of this resin material for exact replicas. We've got 3D prints of adult size hearts with abnormal blood vessels. Where do you think the lab's gonna be in five yeah. years? So in the very near future, we're going to change those rigid blood models into shell models. So how can we see the inside of the heart and not just the impression of blood on the model? Like this one? So a model like this, and what's unique about this is it's printed in a special technology that allows for flexible and rigid material to be printed at the same time. So we can see holes in the model, we can see different structures, but also we can allow interventionalists or surgeons to kind of practice procedures. Yeah. They can go in there, cut different features, they can sew on patches, really plan the entire procedure all with a 3D printed model. Give them more information than ever before. And this is a double outlet right ventricle model, right? And the double outlet right ventricle, this left ventricle has to pump blood to this aorta. And so what you're saying, it has to go through that hole. It's incredible. You know, the surgeons have to actually patch that hole to that aorta. Could you think they could practice on this? Yeah, exactly. So in creating that process, oftentimes you need to place a patch in that region. And that patch needs to be a specific shape. Right now, uh, the procedure goes there inside the operating room, they cut a patch to the specific shape. If they know beforehand the size of that hole, shape of the hole, the orientation of those areas of the anatomy, we can create that patch beforehand and really trim down that surgical time, tr trim down that anesthetic time. And we perceive both of those facets will improve outcomes. That's incredible. And this double outlet right ventricle is one of the complex heart diseases that we see in, uh, in kids, and it comes in all different shapes and sizes, so I would believe this internal anatomy is gonna be very useful. Yeah, exactly, and that's just in the near term. We're already implementing that, as you can see here. So going even further downstream, we're gonna have much more highly detailed models. We're working hand in hand with the radiologist to develop much more refined imaging to allow us to see more structures of the heart that really have been seen up to this point yet and we can see smaller and smaller structures as well. Well, this is one of the ones I really like, Justin, in regards to a uh, heart that's sliced, 
Why did you slice this heart? So this defect is called a ventricular septal defect. So the two pumping chambers, the left and right, there's a hole in this patient that's connecting them. And that means that uh, we, we have this mixture of oxygen rich and oxygen poor that really isn't ideal for any patient. So in order to really visualize this hole, we create the shell component. So this allows us to kind of peel back layers of the heart muscle to reveal this hole. And we can see this hole is right about here. And also in the heart, we have a bunch of structures called trabeculae. And they're a bunch of muscle fibers that really complicate the environment. And that's more so on the right side of the heart. This is the right ventricle. So we see this network, this kind of uh, tangle of muscle fibers that really cloud this hole. Now interventionalists like you need to get inside this area and deploy devices to this hole. Uh, but if we have this kind of tangle of muscle fibers, that really creates a more challenging situation for you. So if I create this model, I perceive that's gonna help you figure out exactly where you need to go to place this device. Well, let's go to the lab and let's put some devices in this hole. Exactly. Let's do it. Dr. Ryan, let's go into the 3D print lab, which is right outside the heart center here at Phoenix Children's Hospital. Absolutely. This is the library of all the hearts. Yeah, so every single heart that we see in this cabinet here represents actual patients from Phoenix Children's Hospital or collaborators that we've worked with. Here we have the main 3D printer. So this printer produces most of the models that we see. Any model that we have that has color features on it comes from this machine here. This is an inkjet technology, so it works very similar to your home printer. Your home printer has a piece of paper that prints ink on. Imagine that process gets repeated hundreds, possibly thousands of times. Instead of one single sheet, we get many different layers created, but um, we start with powders instead of paper. So a very sh thin sheet of powder gets laid out and goes back over glue and ink to bind that layer of powder together. And then we get new layers of powder get spread on top. That process gets repeated thousands of times to create these more complex models. So inside here we have our 3D printer. So like your home printer, you have your ink cartridges, that's what's inside this black box, and your home printer has paper that it prints on. This instead uses powder. So this is gypsum powder, pretty common in drywall. And it lays down a very thin layer of powder on this build platform here. And then as it goes through, it prints with the print heads just like your home printer, and it binds that layer of powder together with glue and ink. And then this silver platform drops down a little bit, fresh layer of powder gets squeezed on top, and then the printing process gets repeated. So Dr. Pofal, what do we have here? So we're gonna close some holes, and these are actual replicas of kids and adults who have ventricular septal defect. And ventricular septal defect is a problem inside the heart, and this is just a bit of a cartoon of the four chambers of the heart, the atria and the ventricles, and then the ventricular septum is a wall between the two sides of the heart. And when there's a hole in the two sides of the heart, uh, the wall between the two sides of the heart, we can close it with particular devices. There's multiple different designs of devices, but if we have an exact replica of somebody's heart and know that their hole is oval and not circle, we can close it. I'm gonna give you a little description of how we close a very straightforward, simple hole. So in doing this, we can actually take a catheter, which goes in the leg, take an umbrella device, pull it through the catheter, advance it through the leg vein, across the hole, and then deploy the umbrella device. And we can pass that circular device through that circular hole and if it fits perfectly, unscrew the cable. And when this cable's unscrewed, take out the device or take out the catheter that actually holds onto the device so that we can actually keep the umbrella device inside of the heart. And then once the, the device is released, the heart skin will grow over the umbrella device and actually um, uh, form heart tissue around it so that you would never even see the device after a long period of time. 
Now in some of the more complicated holes, this is a five-year-old who has a ventricular septal defect and it's called Swiss cheese ventricular septal defects. Each of the holes are in buried in all of these trabeculations of the right ventricle. So there's lots of cords of heart muscle around the holes on this side of the heart. On this side of the heart, you can see two oval shaped holes. Now this circular device likely won't close that oval hole. So we could practice on this 3D model to see if we can use the appropriate device to close the hole before going to the catheterization lab. This is a case of a 70 year old lady who had a post infarct ventricular septal defect. From the left ventricular side, this hole is quite large. And you can even see a crater of the infarct zone from having a heart attack. The left ventricular side, that hole is oval shaped and quite smooth. But from the right ventricular side, it is very complex as there's multiple muscle bands and trabeculations on the right ventricle, making this hole very difficult to close. But we could practice and see what device would fit in that hole before going to the catheterization suite. After practicing, we'll realize that the medium sized circular hole fits perfectly. The smaller hole doesn't fit so well in that the smaller hole doesn't close the left ventricular component of the hole like it should. So as we pass the catheter across the right ventricular side, you can see the left ventricular end and the device open up, pulling it back and closing the hole. The device fits in the trabeculations perfectly, but on the left ventricular side, you can tell that the hole is not completely closed with a small device. So, at least in this model, we could take the device out and put in a medium size device. The medium size device was tried after the large size device and even a different type of device. And then we realized that the medium size device fit just perfectly. And prior to taking this 70 year old woman who just had a heart attack and a post infarct VSD to the catheterization suite, we knew exactly what device to utilize prior to doing this high risk intervention. this device occluded the hole perfectly and the 70 year old lady went home without a hole in the lower chambers of the heart. And this device fits perfectly over that hole. Mrs. Starks? Yes. I'm going to show you what the normal heart is and what is wrong with Gemma's heart. And in order to describe hypoplastic right ventricle, mm -hmm. I'm going to show you what a normal right ventricle looks like in a baby. Okay. And from the 3D printing perspective, we're able to color the um, red and blue sides of the heart in their appropriate sizes in an exact replica of a child's heart. And this is an exact replica of an infant heart wow. that has a normal size right ventricle and a normal size left ventricle. The right ventricle pumps to a normal size pulmonary artery and blue deoxygenated blood will go to the pulmonary arteries to go to the lungs and from the lungs the deoxygenated or blue blood is filled with oxygen and comes back as red blood and that comes to the red side of the heart through the upper chamber the lower chamber, and then eventually to the main vessel in the body called the aorta. Okay. Gemma's left side of the heart is perfectly normal. Okay. Up 
upper chamber, lower chamber, and aorta are perfectly normal. But if you want to compare this right ventricle to Gemma's right ventricle, and this is an exact replica of Gemma's heart when she was first born. Her left ventricle is of normal size, but the right ventricle is one quarter the size of the left ventricle. And that did not grow because there wasn't enough flow to the pulmonary artery. Mm. And you can tell that the pulmonary artery is smaller on her heart than in the normal heart, wow. as well as the right ventricle. And that's because of a narrowing that's formed in the pulmonary artery. When it's really tight, it's called stenosis. Yeah. When it is no flow at all, it's called atresia. Mm -hmm. And so she's right in that area of pulmonary stenosis to pulmonary atresia, and her pulmonary artery did not grow. And blue blood has a great difficulty going from the upper chamber to the lower chamber because of the blockage to the pulmonary artery. So it has to be detoured through this green vessel called the patent ductus arteriosus. Okay. And so this green vessel is shown here and that's what's keeping her alive. You know, in the sense of the blue blood and the red blood need to mix in order for that blood to get to the lungs. And they mix at this level between the upper chambers on the red side and the upper chambers on the blue side. And there needs to be a communication between those two chambers in order for the blood to mix. Okay. And in order to do that, we take a balloon into the upper chambers and tear a hole between the upper and uh, upper two chambers so that the blue and the red blood mix. And now it's time for some questions. Tonight we're talking with Dr. Justin Ryan. Uh, Justin, how long does it take to print a model? So the 3D printing process builds a model layer by layer by layer. So how many layers defines a model really determines how long it takes. So if we have something like this, which is about a day old patient, this takes about two, two and a half hours to 3D print. But if we have something from an older teenager, considerably larger, this would take about six hours to print. Wow, that's impressive. That's quite a size difference. Uh, are the models accurate to size? They certainly can be. Uh, most of the models that we produce are printed at scale. So this represents an actual patient presented at size, as does this one, even though it's considerably larger. This is from an older patient. Now, sometimes we repurpose this for medical education, and to make them stronger, we scale them up. We can do that all on the computer and then send it to a 3D printer. But by and large, the models we produce for surgery, we want the surgeons and inter interventionalists to look at them at size. So that's why we produce these at size. Excellent, that's amazing, that's amazing. And do the models show the inner structures of the heart? So what we see in a model like this, this is what we call blood volume model. So the blood inside the heart is represented here. So these are the pumping chambers, the ventricles. So this represents the blood inside the left ventricle, the blood inside the right ventricle. Now we can do some extra modeling processes to kind of flip that around. If we know that the heart is a muscle, we can reconstruct the muscle part of the heart. So what we have represented now is more the muscle part of the heart. And if I peel this open, then we can see all the lumpy, bumpy structures inside of the heart. So we can really model it both ways. The blood volume, or what we call here is a shell, or myocardium model. So we have either way we can do. Wow, that's amazing. Those are quite different models, but those are incredible purposes for both. That's amazing. Are the models covered by insurance? The models are not covered by insurance. So what we go by right now is to, to run this lab and produce the models, we get grants, research grants or philanthropic grants, even private donations to fund the lab. And that produces the, you know, the, the inflow in order to create these models. We ultimately want insurance to reimburse this, which creates a new kind of medical environment to allow this to be viable, and not just you know our research institute here, but bring this to all the hospitals throughout the nation. So the next step to really realize insurance reimbursement is to create the medical evidence to support this. And we are now part of a clinical trial or one of the three lead sites called PI sites. So we'll be leading this clinical trial to really create the evidence to support 3D printing medicine. 
Are they being created for all surgery patients? And if not, which patients benefit most? That's really a two-part answer. So technologically, not all patients will get a 3D print. We need pretty specific images in order to create a 3D print. We need them to be what they call volumetric. So if we can have a 3D representation of a heart via a CT scan or an MRI, then we have the potential to create a 3D print. Now from there, will all the patients that have those images get a 3D print? Right now we're on a limited funding system. So we get grants, we get donations to support a program. So we use them what we perceive to be meaningful use. So something that is a much more complex case will be more likely to get a 3D print. Now to support the program and bring this to more patients, until we get insurance reimbursement, we really uh, depend on the support from the community. So pchheartaffect.com, donations go in there, will be used to support the program, bring 3D printing to more patients here at the hospital. How has 3D printing revolutionized personalized healthcare? So this really is personalized healthcare. We are able to create a 3D print of a patient's model based off patient-specific images. It really doesn't get much more personalized than that. Every 3D print of a heart I produce comes from an actual patient and represents their specific anatomy. So that is how we're really targeting this personalized healthcare. We're revolutionizing the way that doctors, surgeons, interventionalists look at medical images before they step foot in their operating room. This really is the image that's been realized physically. Very cool. How many 3D heart models have you produced? To date, we're about 320 heart models for surgical or interventional planning. Uh, we've done other models for medical education, so we're, we're you know, high up there, probably near 400 in terms of all 3D prints we've done. Wow. How do you use 3D printing for other programs within the hospital? So inside the hospital, we've produced 3D prints for other departments. So while we are the cardiac 3D print lab, we do non-cardiac as well. Uh, the BNI at PCH program, they have a brilliant scientist, uh, Dr. Johnny Lifshitz, and he had this idea to 3D print tumors, but not 3D print tumors for surgical planning, but print them to allow a patient, you know, who's a small kid, to look at a tumor understand what he or she has been through in terms of surgery or radiation therapy, and then ultimately smash it. So this cathartic expression of getting over a disease, to smash a representation of their own tumor. So we're, we're, we're working with other departments to bring 3D printing into many different facets of healthcare. Not just surgical planning, but also patient empowerment, medical education, family education. So all facets really holistically change healthcare and bring personalized medicine to it. So it helps with some emotional healing as well. Oh, absolutely. What do you see in the future for 3D printing in healthcare? So immediately 3D printing in healthcare is gonna continue this trend of creating anatomical models prior to a procedure. And they're gonna get much more uh, detail. So this is what we produce currently internally. And this is a representation of the anatomy. But we can also produce a model like this. Now this model is flexible and allows a surgeon to go in there and cut different areas and basically perform a mock surgery. So allow them to have more information, have that experience beforehand, so it gives them more information before they set their foot in the operating room. How can these prints help in planning future surgeries? Well, the, the motto, since we've got the 3D technology here, is if you see it better, you could fix it better. And so as a catheterization person, I know where to put the catheters and where to close holes and what to clog up or put stents if I could see it better. And if I could study it ahead of time, I can do a better job when I'm in the catheterization lab. As a surgeon, you know, have to ask the surgeons, but they love the 3D models. They have them on their desk the day before surgery. They look at the inside of the heart. They look at the outside of the heart. We haven't yet printed models that they can sew into yet, but I see that in the future. And so I think it helps you with future surgeries by knowing the landscape better, seeing the 3D Google map, you know, of the, the, of the landscape so that you can plan your surgery better. But even in the future, this is gonna get even better so that you can even do surgeries and practice ahead of time. I imagine that it helps with the time spent on the patient. Well, that's a great question. So the time spent on the patient, it means 
not being under general anesthesia, having less complications, and having precision surgery or precision intervention is, is huge. And so if you have an accurate, detailed, personalized map, like in a 3D model, you can limit the amount of time that you're either under x-ray in the catheterization suite or on bypass in the operating room. How has this technology changed your work? As Now I have two hats, a, a catheterization doctor as well as a transplant doctor, and it's actually changed both of my, my worlds. As a catheterization physician, if I can see the heart better, I can do a better job in the catheterization lab using less time, less x-ray, less radiation to the patient in order to do precision, precision intervention. A precision intervention would be, I know the hole is an oval shape or a rectangular shape, so I could put it in a device that is appropriate for that hole. Or if there's a, uh, an extra blood vessel that's not supposed to be there, I know exactly where it is, so I don't have to do repeat pictures prior to closing that extra vessel. Thank you, Dr. Paul Fall and Dr. Ryan. I know as a parent, I learned a lot tonight. On behalf of the Phoenix Children's Heart Center Family Advisory Council and Phoenix Children's Hospital, thank you for watching this video. We hope you found it interesting and that you'll share it with your friends. We also hope that you'll join us next time for our Heart Talks educational videos at Phoenix Children's Hospital.